Well, I like to think that the lesson this morning was on the positive side, talked about heaven. The one tonight may be what some people would call a little bit negative, but I think we have to have a balance. Sometimes I was just talking to someone before services tonight, and you know, the comment was made, I don't think we talk enough about heaven. And I would agree with that. I don't think we talk enough about hell either, to be quite honest with you, um, because there are a lot of people who just don't believe it's real. Um, and so, you know, I think that's probably, I think we've uh, probably over the years a, 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 in an effort not to um, offend people um, have, have watered down um, our teaching on hell as we have, I think, probably to some extent in our teaching on the subject of sin. And so, um, we we'll talk a little bit about that tonight. As I said, it, it, it may be considered a little bit on the negative side, but uh, there is there is a positive side to what we have to talk about tonight too. So uh, we'll get there. Um, let me just begin our our lesson tonight with a couple of couple of questions, a couple of true false questions, and you don't have to call out the answers, but just you know think about this: true or false? If we break the law because we don't know the law, then we won't be held liable for breaking the law. And I think we understand that that's false. Ignorance of the law is no excuse for breaking the law. Um, you know, I've heard that many times over the years in my life, and I'm sure you have too. So here's another question, true or false? If we sin because we don't know God's commandments, we will not be considered guilty of sin. And I think just like with being ignorant of the law, you know, we understand that that's false. Ignorance of God's commandments does not absolve one of guilt. And, and so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about the idea that Ignorance is not an excuse for sin. Um, because I think a lot of times people have this idea that, well, if I don't know what's right or wrong, then I can't be held liable for God's not going to count it against me. But I think we're going to see that, unfortunately, that is not true. Um, it is not true, as you may have heard in your life, that ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. Um, you know, and what's the perceived advantage of being ignorant of any law, whether we're talking about the law of the city, the law of the land, or the law of God? The perceived advantage is that it assumes innocence due to ignorance, and it assumes lack of accountability to a higher authority, and it also assumes no need for repentance or change if, the, if it truly is true that ignorance is bliss. But has God ever accepted ignorance as an excuse for sin? Look with me, if you will, go back to the Old Testament uh, for just a moment, to the little book of Hosea, um, one of the minor prophets, over in Hosea chapter 4. And look with me at verse 6, and, and notice here what God says is God speaking through Hosea. And he says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priest for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. And so essentially what God says is... My people are ignorant of my law. And he says, as a result of that, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. They're being destroyed by their ignorance of God's law. They were committing sin because they didn't know it was sin. 
But God says, it's destroying them. Their ignorance of my law is just Now, did the people have access to knowledge? Whose responsibility was it to make sure that they had that knowledge? Well, the, God set up the, the, the Levitical system to, to teach them that knowledge. And so the reason for their lack of knowledge is the teachers who were supposed to be teaching them the knowledge weren't teaching them the knowledge. And as a result, they, and so but what God says is both are guilty. The Levites are guilty. And the people are guilty of their sin because they're ignorant of the law. Now go over with me in the New Testament to 2 Thessalonians. And this is a passage that we referred to this morning. We didn't read it. But I want us to, I want us to read it tonight. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Verses 7 through 9, this is talking about Jesus returning in judgment. And he says, part of the reason that Jesus is going to return in judgment, verse 7, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, is to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord is revealed from, the heaven, from heaven with his holy angels. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Did you notice there that Paul mentions two groups of people who are going to experience the vengeance of Jesus? He says, first of all, or actually he says it second of all, but I'm going to talk about it first. Those who do not obey the gospel of Christ. These are people who have the knowledge, but they'll be brought under judgment because they willfully rejected to put it into practice. But look at the second group, which is actually the first. Those who do not know God. Those who are ignorant of the will of God. And I think the implication here is that they probably chose not to know him. But he says those who are ignorant of God's commandments are going to suffer the wrath of Christ. So what we see throughout the history that is revealed in God's word is that God has held all people accountable to his will. Let's go back again and let's take a look at Israel. Let's look in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And let's see what God had to say about Israel's responsibility. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And so he says, essentially, you need to keep my law in front of your face all the time. Wherever you turn, you need to have a reminder of the law of God. And why was that? So that they didn't become ignorant of what God wanted. And why he says that you're to teach them in your, to your children when you sit down, when you rise up, when you're walking along the way. Talk about the law of God. Talk about the word of God and talk about it to your children. And why teach them to their children? So that their children wouldn't be ignorant. Because do you remember what it says over and over? There arose, like, there arose in Israel a generation that did not know Joseph. And do you remember what was special about Joseph? Joseph knew God. And Joseph knew God's will. 
So if they didn't know Joseph, they didn't know God's will either. So it's very important that it was very important for the, the children of Israel to constantly talk about the law of God. Now go with me to Nehemiah the 8th chapter. Nehemiah chapter 8. And you'll remember that Israel has is starting to return from captivity and they find the book of the law. And Ezra stands before the people and, and they stand for days on end as, as Ezra reads the law to the people. But look at me. Look with me. Where is it? Well, let's just, let's just read it. Beginning in verse 1. All the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. This is Nehemiah chapter 8. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded. So Ezra brought the law before the assembly and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning till midday before the men and the women, those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made and at his right hand stood a bunch of men whose names I can't pronounce. Verse 5, And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And so, again, I'm not going to go through all of those names in verse 7. It said that they, all of these men helped the people understand the law, and the people stood in their place, verse 8, so they read distinctly from the book, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. My question is to you, why did they weep? Because they understood. Verse 12. They went their way to eat and drink and send portions and rejoice greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. They understood after hearing the law and having it explained to them that they were guilty of not keeping the law, of being ignorant of the law, for so many years and they were mournful they were sad they grieved because they had grieved God and they grieved when they realized the state this put them in but thanks be to God that he gave them the opportunity to hear it to listen to it to understand it and so God held Israel accountable to his word. So, what about all of those other nations that weren't Israel? Did God hold them accountable to some sort of law? Well, if you look over in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, this is actually a prophecy about the children of Israel coming into possession of the land of Canaan. But I want you to notice with me in Genesis 15 and verse 16. Um, actually, let's, let's begin in verse 14. The people would hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. The chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them by the greatness of your arm. They will be as still as stone till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom you purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain 
of your inheritance in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. Do you know why God was allowing the Israelites to go into the land of Canaan and destroy and drive out all of those people? Because he was holding those people accountable for their sins. And he wouldn't punish someone if they weren't accountable for their sins. So even the nations who were not Israel, God held accountable. Do you remember in the book of Jonah, who did God send Jonah to preach to? He wasn't Jews. It was the people of Nineveh. And he sent Jonah to preach to the people of Nineveh to tell them to repent. You can't repent of something that's not a sin. And so God held them accountable. And again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, that we just read a little while ago, who is going to face the wrath of Christ and his angels in the last day? Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ from whatever nation they live in. So God holds people accountable, ignorant or not, of what his law is. And what's the penalty for sin? Romans 3.23. One that we should all have memorized. For the wages of sin is death. But, but the free gift of God is eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. The penalty for sin, for any sin, and we've just seen that God holds all accountable, is death. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, well, that was, that, that was Romans 6, 23 that I, I quoted just a minute ago, that the wages of sin is death. Um, but the, the, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But he tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All sinned. If all sin, all are held accountable ignorant or not and in Romans chapter 6 if all sin ignorant or not all will receive the wages of sin if they don't repent ignorant or not so that's the negative part of the lesson is that God holds all men accountable for sin whether they know what sin is or not but here's the good news. This is the positive part of the lesson. And that's that there is a remedy for ignorance. And it's called knowledge. What did Jesus say about himself over in John the 14th chapter and verse 6? John chapter 14 and verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said, no one can come to the Father except through him. And what does this imply then about those who will be saved? Number one, they can't be ignorant of who Christ is. And they cannot be ignorant of of the gospel of Christ. But again, here's the good news. The gospel is that the gospel is available to all. Whether you live here, whether you live, it doesn't matter. The gospel has been translated, the Bible has been translated into virtually every language upon the face of the earth. So no one need be ignorant of who Jesus is or of the gospel of Christ. Because ignorance of the gospel cannot lead to salvation. Over in John, the sixth chapter, and verse 68, 
John chapter 6 and verse 68. Again, this is Jesus. Or actually Peter responding to Jesus. He says, Peter said to him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. There's no other place to go to receive the words of eternal life but to Jesus and to the gospel of Jesus. And the Apostle Paul said over in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone, everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God that can save all men. And then go with me to the passage that Brother Ken read for us. I'm not going to reread it uh, necessarily, but I just want to point something out about what this passage says about Christ and the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and he began in verse 21. Paul says, It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached, to save those who believe. What is the message preached? That's the gospel. And what Paul says is what saves men is the preaching of the gospel. It's not going to be a sign that the Jews want. It's not going to be man-made wisdom that the Gentiles want. But what's going to save men is Christ crucified. It is the power of God and the wisdom of God, he says, in verse 24. The only thing that is going to save men's souls is Jesus and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, can we use ignorance of sin as an excuse? Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14. He says, verse 13, Therefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. People without God follow their lusts in ignorance. But followers of God seek out knowledge so that they can avoid those things that they formerly did in ignorance. So how do we replace our ignorance with knowledge. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 Study or be diligent to show yourself approved. A workman who needs not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of God. How do we replace our ignorance with knowledge? We need to be diligent and I love the old, I love the King James, what the King James says, study to show yourself approved. And that, both of those words, I know, it's the same Greek word, translated two different ways. But that means it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some effort to become knowledgeable and replace that ignorance. But, with the availability of the word today in so many forms, can we truly claim ignorance as an excuse? Really? I've got, I'm sitting here with two paper copies of the Bible. I've got an electronic copy on my phone. You all have, some of you have tablets with the Bible. 
We've got the Bible on audio. We've got the, you know, really? Can we use ignorance as an excuse with the availability of the scripture today? Look with me at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 17. This is a commandment from Christ through Paul. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. We can, we can understand. We can't buy into the idea that the Bible can't be understood. Do you remember what Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17? All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. And you, you all know this by now. I'm a questions guy. That raises a question in my mind. When we try to say that the Bible can't be understood, but then the Bible tells us that God has given us something that will make us complete. Is God going to give us something that will make us complete and then make it impossible to understand? <laughs> you know, as... As, as Mr. Spock would say, Jim, that's just not logical. It, it just, it is not logical that God would give us such a great treasure and then make it impossible to understand. It can be understood. The problem is what we read just a few minutes ago. Study to show yourself approved. Be diligent. It takes work. And that's where a lot of people, I think, fall down, is they don't put in the work. They don't put in the diligence. So we're going to wrap, wrap this thing up, hopefully fairly quickly tonight. But I want to talk a little bit about preventing ignorance, because it, it really is... Preventing ignorance of God's word is a twofold responsibility. First of all, we have to make sure that we're, we're, we ourselves are not ignorant. So, in this case, it is about me. I have to make sure I'm not ignorant. Um, again, 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show yourselves approved. Um, Ephesians 5.17 Understand what the will of the Lord is. And a lot of Paul's teaching was really geared toward preventing ignorance of God's will. You know, when, when over in Romans chapter 6 where he's talking to them, they had this idea that, well, if we continue, the more we sin, the more grace God's going to give us. Paul, in that discussion, which was a false idea, by the way, he, he uses a phrase there. In the New King James Version, he says, Do you not know? But I like the American Standard Version. It's a little more to the point. Are you ignorant? <laughs> Don't you know that that is not the case? Over in Romans chapter 11, Paul is talking about God's plan to save the Jews through the gospel. And I believe this is where he's talking about how the, the, uh, the Jews were pruned out of the natural olive tree so that the Gentiles who were wild olives could be grafted in. But he tells the Gentiles, he said, don't be ignorant about this. Don't think that you've got it made because... You can be pruned out just like they were. So he, he talks of, don't be ignorant, 
about what the will of God is. And then 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse, verse 23, Paul instructs Timothy to avoid ignorant discussions. How many angels can fit on the head of a pen? <laughs> avoid those types of discussions. Look with me in Philippians chapter 2. In verse 12, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul says, work out your own salvation. That means that there is something on my part that has to be done in order for me to be saved. My question is, can we be ignorant of God's will and work out our own salvation? Is there anybody who is going to accidentally be saved? I don't think so. It takes knowledge of God's word in order to be saved. So we have a responsibility to prevent ignorance in ourselves, number one, so that we're not lost. <laughs> but number two, we have, we can't be ignorant ourselves so that we can help others not be ignorant too. And probably, you know, the one that hits home for a lot of us is a lot of times where this starts is with our children. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 9, which I think we may have read already, but the, uh, the, the Israelites were told that they needed to teach their children. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 9. Let's read verse 8. Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you that you may be strong and go in and possess the land which you uh, which you cross over to possess and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. That's, you know, if, if they didn't pass on the words of God, the law of God, God said your land's going to be taken away from you. And guess what happened? That very thing happened. Because they didn't pass it on to their children. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. God didn't change his mind between the Old Testament and the New about the responsibility for parents to teach their children to not have their children be ignorant of the law of God. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Do, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. And why are fathers tasked with that so that their children won't be lost? And we all know that we can do that and we can do it to the best of our ability and sometimes they're still going to make bad decisions. But that doesn't absolve us of our responsibility. We're also supposed to teach each other to prevent ignorance in each other. Go back, you know, again, think about 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is where that, that list of what it's profitable for comes in. For doctrine, for teaching one another, for reproof, for correction, correcting each other, not just ourselves. For instruction in righteousness, for instructing one another. And so we have a responsibility to each other to prevent ignorance. We also have a responsibility to the lost. 
Acts chapter 2. Go back and read when you have a chance Peter's sermon. But read it with this focus of preventing ignorance. Peter's whole point in that sermon was to dispel their ignorance about Jesus. And when he did that, that's when they were convicted of their sin. And that's when they obeyed the gospel. When they were no longer ignorant of who Jesus really was. And Jesus said, or Paul said he was the son, or Peter said he was the son of God, and you killed him. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Once that ignorance was overcome, it produced a change that needed, to, that needed to happen. So, ignorance is not an excuse for sin. And we will be held accountable to God whether we're ignorant of His Word or not. And that's, that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. But again, as I pointed out tonight, we don't have an excuse to be ignorant because we've got the Word. We've got ex more accessible today than it's ever been in the history of mankind. I have a quote here as we finish up. I don't even remember where I got this quote. But it says, Though one may have a treatable form of cancer, if he does not know he was sick or is unaware of the treatment, he will eventually die of his condition. Is being ignorant, is, is a person being ignorant of their illness going to save them from the consequences of that illness? No. And what we know is that mankind has a treatable form of spiritual cancer. And what we know is that he can know that he's sick. And he can know what the treatment is. Being ignorant of it is not going to save him from his cancer. So we have a responsibility to make sure they know, to make sure they know what the treatment is. And that we know, and we know what the treatment is. So just a reminder tonight that uh, we, run, we run into people on a daily basis who, again, I was talking before services about you know, some things that people believe that have no basis in Scripture. But they are just convinced that those things are true. And they don't have a clue that they're sick. We've got a responsibility. Because we run into people every day who are dying of spiritual cancer and they don't even know it. And they don't know how to treat it, much less know that they've got it. So hopefully this, this will help us. Um, to, to recognize our responsibility. And so tonight, you know, we don't, as far as I can see, everyone here tonight is, is Christian. And so I'm not going to go through the plan of salvation for you tonight because you know what that is. But there may be somebody here tonight who is suffering spiritually or maybe you're suffering physically and it's causing you to suffer spiritually and there's something that we can do to help we want to help you and so tonight if you have any need that we can help you fill through Christ we want you to come forward and let us know how we can help as we sing this invitation song